just for you uh, down that way. I wouldn't take the elevator, though. You can, but it's the Jim Godwin elevator for a reason. John, that was awesome, man. Thanks so much. Uh, that was a blessing. Uh, John is uh, a real blessing to me because I feel like uh, he's a co-equal and we share a lot of things in common. We share a lot of uh, uh, theology uh, uh, and uh, it's wonderful uh, that I can stay back here and, and sit back here or even be out of town and, and somebody as thoughtful and as, uh, as considerate and about the details and uh, just a, a true uh, soul that I just trust and, and believe in is here and so I just feel like he's a big deal in our church and I've been here this year it'll be 20 years that I've been in this little church and and most of the stuff that happens is, is never been seen or understood by any of the general public but uh, it's hard to do and uh, and there's people that come along that are good and I remember Scott Calhoun telling me a long ago uh, he was like look if you ever find somebody that's really good and really special you just need to hire them and ask the questions later because they're going to be good, they're going to do it good, and you'll be glad. But if you try to find these people that are meet these positions, and do all, you're never going to get there. And John's just one of those people, special. We're really glad to have him. He's working in seminary right now, Fuller Seminary, which is where I went to seminary. So I'm, I, I love uh, getting to hear uh, because we basically get to, he reads books for us is what's happening there. And uh, so it's really good. And it's really good because he's up on what's happening in the world and and. and the, the theology that's being sort of discussed and worked out uh, on those uh, levels, we get to we get to be a part of that and, and have a way into that. And so John uh, being able to share gives us that. And so uh, I have no idea what he's going to talk about, uh, but I'm excited about it. And so uh, if you don't mind welcoming John, who's doing double duty today. Hey, Thanks, John. John. Hey, John. <laughs> Appreciate it. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but every time we reach this point of the new year, I I feel a lot of pressure to change, whether it's to stop doing something I've been doing or to start doing something I shouldn't be doing all along. There's a lot of resolutions. There's a lot of pressure. Um, everybody's trying to organize their, their calendars so that they can really commit this time and really get those things right. Um, and I got to thinking about change and how much it scares us, how much we struggle with it, how much we really hold on to the things we know. And uh, I realized, you know, between that and, and a lot of the scripture that I've been studying, that the willingness to change really seems to be the core of righteousness. It seems to be that the foundation of the Christian faith is the desire to be different, the desire to open yourself and allow God to change you. Um, so uh, me and Bo talked about it. We decided we're going to start using the lectionary as a kind of a guideline to preach from because it kind of unifies things, keeps us on the same page as other groups and other churches. Um, so the scripture this week is Mark, uh, I forgot the verses. Mark 1, uh, yeah, 4 through 11. And I, Bo's referred to this passage a couple times in the last few months, um, but there's a, a few things here that I wanted to kind of unpack. Um, so... And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole, uh, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and ate wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came down from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. There's a lot to unpack there if you really want to take time to consider symbolism and um, you know, I'm very fortunate to, to be able to go to seminary and, and find these resources that are giving me way more cultural context, way more understanding of what some of these things might represent to the first readers. Um, it was a popular belief, not just in early Israelite culture, but in a lot of surrounding cultures, uh, and it still is, that the first way of knowing God is not necessarily his given word, 
but maybe that the first given word of God is creation itself, that by studying the way that creation works, we can learn a lot about the way that God works. We can learn a lot about what God might be planning for creation, just looking at the cycles of nature. And when you look at John the Baptist, you see somebody who really bought into that to the point where he left society so that he could live in nature. He clothed himself with things that he could find in nature. He fed himself with nature, which means that he must have spent a lot of time in solitude studying <laughs> the things that he was seeing, watching the cycles of nature. And so John must have come to the conclusion that in order to repent, in order to turn away from sins, from the things that are keeping us far from God, we need a symbolic renewal. We need a cycle. And water is, in many ways, it's one of the best metaphors for so much of spirituality, so much of God. But he realized that the, the cleansing of the body was the first place to start for us to change our minds. That you know, over our lifetimes, we gather so much thinking, we gather so much belief, we gather so much behavior, and that we need to wash all that away, let go of every bit of it, and start fresh in order to really live in accordance with what God is trying to do right now. And so John baptizes with water, and he's even saying that there's one coming later that's, you know, the water is secondary. This is an image, this is a, a symbol, a metaphor. The spirit is what will baptize you. Your, your internal self will be changed, cleansed. Your sins will be taken away, and you'll be able to, to move into a newness of life through Jesus Christ. And I wondered why Jesus, being a perfect person, being the perfect human, why he would feel the need to go through this cleansing ritual. And it occurred to me that you know, in the moment that he does it, and he comes up out of the water and God says, This is my son with whom I'm well pleased, it was his willingness to change. It was his willingness to open to something new. And I think that posture of openness to God is what all of us Christians are called into. That that's the righteousness being fulfilled. It's nothing we can do on our own. We can't change ourselves. We can't change anything. God is the agent of change. God is the one that's allowing this to exist in the first place. And us, by letting go of what we think we know, letting go of what we think we're supposed to be holding on to, and opening ourselves up to being washed, being cleansed, and being set fresh into this next day of life, into this next year of life, that's the righteousness that we have available to us. The choice that we have is the choice about whether or not to open up to that. Um, that was the image that really resonated with me, and it, it, uh, it kind of came also because, you know, this is only the second week of this quarter of seminary, it just started back up, and on day two of class I had a pretty meaty paper due. Like, I should have been reading the syllabus way, you know, way ahead of time. Um, but I'm taking uh, Old Testament studies, and I'm taking an introduction to Hebrew. Um, it's a lot. But the uh, Old Testament studies class is where I had to write the essay. And we were told to read the book of Job uh, in its entirety, and then read commentaries on it, and then write our own analysis and interpretation of what we think is happening in that story. And Job's hard to read. I don't know if you've tried to read it recently. Uh, it's really sad. Um, even when you get past the part where Job's losing all of these good things, the rest of the book is just arguments between him and his friends about why God must hate him and uh, you know, what he must have done to deserve this. And so that was interesting to learn, too, that not just in early Israelite culture, but in other surrounding cultures, and I think even now today we all have this somewhere deep inside us, there's the belief that if you're living righteously, if you're doing well, God will bless you. And if you are living in pain and suffering, you must have done something wrong to deserve it. God punishes people and rewards them in this life for their actions. And there's one source that kind of said that Job was very likely written to kind of push back against that idea and show someone who, according to the book of Job, was completely righteous. He had done everything right. He was a beacon in his community. He was so flawless that, that God was like, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him. He's, he's pretty much perfect. And that even somebody who was living that righteous life, who was doing everything correctly, is still subject to suffering, still subject to loss, still subject to pain. So they argue through the, the course of the book, all of his friends telling him to just repent and say you're sorry, and he's like, I didn't do anything, and it's just back and forth. And then God comes up out of nowhere, and he's, he's mad at Job, and he's mad at his friends. He's mad at his friends for speaking incorrectly about it. He says, you know, Job spoke correctly about me that, that I'll do what I'm going to do and it doesn't reflect on the character of the person that I'm doing it for or to. 
So you saying that I only reward and punish based on your actions and on your, the quality of your heart is, is not right. But he's mad at Job because Job is so self-righteous and knows he hasn't done anything wrong. And he spends a lot of time lamenting everything that he lost and saying, you know, I'd rather be dead than live with the memory of every good thing that I ever had and not be able to have it anymore. And I think that's the sin that Job, that Job commits in his story, is to believe that because he had it all, and it was all taken from him, that his life was worthless, that there wasn't anything left for him. I think that the message of Job is that our openness to change, our willingness to let go of all the things that we have, the good, the bad, the ugly, to make peace with the fact that we're all subject to suffering, whether or not we did anything to deserve it, that gives us the freedom to step into a new moment, to step into a new version of life. And, and if you read all the way to the end of Job, everything's restored to him. He gets twice as much gold and his family's you know, full again. But the idea that he would have, he would much rather have died than wait to see what was going to happen later, I think resonates with a lot of us. When we have the things that we've worked for, the things that we think we deserve and that we've earned taken from us forcefully, or we face a choice of having to give those things away, we are very quick to guard those things. So I see that like at the core of a lot of our sinful behavior is this clinging, this holding on to stuff, whether it's physical stuff or mental stuff, status, all these things, we're just holding on so tight because, I mean, if we're honest, being alive is kind of weird and, and holding on to things that feel permanent or feel familiar is a source of comfort for a lot of us. But I think that the spiritual truth is that God is present with us in this moment, in this life. And if we can cling to that first, everything else can change. And I know a lot of you have heard me say that before. It's something I'm really trying to internalize and be open to in my own life because as much as I can see these things and I can say these things, I cling to a lot of stuff too. But I think that that's the image that we're given in that passage of Mark, that John in the wilderness saw the cycles of nature, saw the cycles of destruction and rebuilding, and saw that we're subject to those same cycles that we have to be willing to move into the rebirth in order to benefit from it. We have to be willing to move into it open-heartedly and with love in order for it to take off in us. And if we're holding on to anything from what we thought we were supposed to have, from what we thought we were supposed to be, we're just getting in the way of what God's changing us into. The classic image is the butterfly, right? The caterpillar makes a cocoon and then it becomes goo. It completely decomposes into gel and then becomes a beautiful butterfly. That must not be pleasant, right? <laughs> That's gotta be painful on some level to let go of your whole shape, what you think you are, so that you can go into a period of absolute unknowing and come out the other side more beautiful, more vibrant, more effective than ever before. Mm -hmm. I think as we go into this new year, we would really do well to take inventory of our lives, look at the things that we're really holding on to, and not everything's bad, you know. There are some things that we keep with us because they are genuinely good. But we should be honest with ourselves. This, this habit, this vice, this pattern in my life, is it preparing me to change? Is it preparing me to step into action when God calls me into action? Or is it keeping me rooted right here, defending myself from what's happening around me? I think that Jesus' willingness to symbolically have himself cleansed, even though he had done nothing wrong, is the righteousness that, that inspired God to say, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. He knows he's righteous. He knows that he's done no wrong, and he's still willing to be open to something new. I think that's all I really have to say today. Uh, I just, I love this church, and I love this community, and between you and my family and my friends, the people in my life, well, times are getting scarier and the world's getting bleaker. We as Christians have to be holding on to that non-physical, spiritual light inside of us that God's given us. We have to hold on to that as our first hope so that when the things around us change, we don't find ourselves destroyed by losing everything we thought we were supposed to have. We find ourselves encouraged to step into a new phase, something brand new built together something more beautiful than was there before. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to let us go because I don't think there's much else I can add to that. But thank you for being here and thank you for listening. Father, we come before you. We just want 
to feel your love in our lives. Whether or not we've associated love with, with our belongings or with our luxuries or with our comfort or not, Father, I pray that you would help us to find that real love, the love that does allow us to suffer, does allow us to experience pain, but it's because you know where all of this is headed. You've got plans that we can't even begin to comprehend. Father, I pray that you would give us the courage and the faith to live in lockstep with you as we go forward, that we would be open to your pressures, your leadings, that we might make a bigger difference in the world while we're here. Father, if every one of us that claims you as our Lord acted in the ways that you would have us act, this would be such a beautiful place to live, so much less bleak than it's starting to look, Father. And I pray that you would wake each of us up, each of us believers, you would have Put your hand on our hearts and call us into that action. Call us into that newness of life every waking morning so that we might step out into the world living from your implanted spirit, radiating that joy, that light, that life into the world around us, refreshing it, renewing it, restoring it, preparing it for what's coming next, building together something more beautiful than was there before, Father. I pray that you would guide us in these efforts. I pray that you would comfort us in our, in our troubles, that you would allow us to feel your love even as things hurt, that, that we would know that your love is so, so unconditional, so far beyond our concepts of love, that even when it doesn't feel like you're there, Lord, you are there, and we should know that. We should hold on to that first. I pray that for every person in this room, and I pray that as we go out into the world today, Lord, that we would be encouraged, we would be enlivened, and we would be seeking your presence in everything we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody.